Hello, welcome everybody to the advanced deep learning lecture. Um, today, I wanted to follow up essentially what we have talked about in the previous lectures on generative models, right? So we have seen a lot of things on GANs, we have seen autoregressive models, and we have also seen how we can use possibly GANs on, on videos and so on, right? Um, today, I want to talk a bit about rendering in general, specifically leading into neural rendering and what that actually means. I mean, it's a term that has been come up very recently, um, basically in the last year or so, there have been very, very many research papers around that. And first of all, I wanted to actually do a step backwards. Now I, I want to go away from neural networks for a second. Um, and I wanted to explain quickly what, what rendering means actually and where this comes from. So rendering is a thing that comes mostly from computer graphics. And that's essentially how we make videos in movies or how we um, do video games. Um, and basically how we can go from a synthetic scene description and how we can create images out of these ones. So if you have taken some graphics courses, what you will learn first is you basically have a scene description. Um, and this scene description is a, is a 3D description that tells you what is in your environment, right? So you basically have a bunch of objects here in the scene. You have a bunch of shapes. Each of these shapes have different materials that defines their appearance. You have light, you have, um, well, the geometry, of course. Typically, it's a triangle mesh. Um, often you have animations when you have people in it and so on. Um, and all these kind of things, they make up your 3D scene representation, basically, right? So it defines what's in the scene. And now in order to take the scene representation and make an image out of it, you need to define the camera parameters. Um, and you have two types of camera parameters. You have the int uh, intrinsic camera parameters. That's basically how the projection matrix works, right? How do you go from, from, the, from a current viewpoint um, into, a, into a 2D image plane, right? Um, and that essentially defines like, you know, things like depth of field would also be in here, um, motion blur and stuff like this you would have here. But in practice, often you only have a focal length and you have a principal point. Um, that's what people use in computer vision often. Um, so it's a bit of an oversimplified pinhole camera model of the real world. And the second thing, in addition to the intrinsics, are the camera extrinsics, the pose. This is the camera viewpoint. This is where do you want to place this camera here uh, in order to look at the scene. So it's basically changing the viewpoint, right? Uh, in practice, you have um, six degrees of freedom. You have three for the rotation and three for the translation. Um, that's enough to define um, where to put the current camera location, right? Um, and again, if you're putting all of these three things here together, right? So we have the scene description here. Um, we have a camera viewpoint here. So where do you look at the stuff? Um, and then we have the, the projection goes from this frustum here into this image plane here. Um, that tells us basically how do we generate an image from the current 3D description, right? Um, and this is a process that has been examined in computer graphics for for decades um, and there's various techniques how to go for instance from this 3d scene then to the 2d image you can do rasterization you can do ray tracing um, there's various different ways in terms of how to define materials there's different ways how to define lighting um, uh, geometry and so on so all of these kind of things um, they all gonna they all gonna be researched in graphics, right? And people have made a lot of progress. And um, most of these things, what they do is they kind of they have this idea of photorealistic image synthesis. Um, here's a, a very popular paper from computer graphics, the rendering equation. That essentially this integral here defines the light transport in the scene. So if you have light from a from a source from a light source being emitted, right? These light rays they all bounce around in the scene. They're gonna be reflected and refracted. Um, on the on the on the objects and eventually um, um, that determines the, the appearance of the respective object and then you have a projection matrix and go um, to to the current image plane. Um, so practically you have like this is the 3D definition, right? Um, then you you get the um, the shape accordingly. You texture it and you evaluate the lighting and you're gonna get. Uh, these kind of result images. This is from Avatar in this case, right? Um, this is what people are doing all the time. Like again, for entertainment purposes, for video games, um, movies, and so on. Um, I should say this process is very well understood. So if I'm gonna give you a really good description in 3D, um, and I know all the parameters I need for rendering, 
um, with state-of-the-art graphics methods, you can get actually pretty good looking images. And, and these images are actually looking very realistic. So they're gonna be photorealistic. Okay, sure, this is not a real character here, but if you're taking some um, things like cars or so on, um, I can render them to a degree that they are basically indistinguishable from reality. So if you're looking at, um, at the images of a news, uh, of like a, a photo magazine or so today, most of these rendered images, uh, renderings, and they're not real photos actually. So this process works pretty well, but the big challenge you're gonna have there is, in computer graphics today, is how do you get the need, how do you get the 3D content? So this 3D representation, like, I mean, setting up a camera position is easy, but the, the 3D content, that's the hard part. Um, in practice, what you need is, you need the geometry, right, that defines your scene, uh, you need textures, um, that are mapped on top of this geometry uh, and you're going to have lighting uh, and material parameters. And for these kind of things, what you typically see at the very end of a, either video game or a movie, you see in the, in the credits, you see a lot of people who have done that. These are the content creation artists um, and that's typically for a, for, for a Hollywood movie today, um, everything is CG basically. So you have like four, five, six hundred people creating this content for you. And geometry could include a little bit more than just the environment here. It could also be you have animation, right? You have facial animation parameters and stuff like that. So all of these things are gonna be actually in the in the 3D geometry, uh, in the 3D content, and this has to be manually created. One of the motivations, um, what people had if, um, from, from graphics in a while, they thought, hmm, well, maybe we can automatically generate this process. Uh, and we can we can reconstruct um, all of the material, lighting, and texture and geometry parameters from real world images. And this is what computer vision is basically trying to do, right? In computer vision, you have the opposite problem. You have a 2D image, and you're trying to get back to the 3D representation, 3D understanding, and stuff like that. Um, and this is the thing um, in computer vision. There has been a lot of work trying to do that, like trying to do 3D reconstruction. Um, multi-view stereo, slam methods, all these kind of things, that, that's what people have been working on. Um, and this was, for instance, a very, very important paper here was uh, Building Rome in a Day, very famous paper in uh, computer vision in 2009. That's like, you know, 10 years ago. Um, this is structure from motion work um, with a bundle adjuster. Um, and what they did is, this is from uh, Dubrovnik. Um, they took a bunch of, uh, from the city of Dubrovnik, they took a, took a bunch of, um, touristic images here and what they did is they they basically found features they ran their bundle adjuster and they got these point clouds as a result of the structure for motion process right and you can already see well um you get the structure you see here all these frustum at the bottom they, they're visualizing where the original images came from you get a rough intuition what the 3d stuff looks like but it doesn't look nearly as good as if you hired like a couple of hundred artists like in a video game right um, or in a movie. So that's that's still a challenge. So if you're talking about 3D digitizations, um, this is often what I'm what I'm trying to refer to the gap between graphics and vision. If I'm looking at computer graphics models, they look like this. This is a rendered image from a car and it looks pretty perfect. Um, and on the other side, if I look at images in computer vision papers, um, this is something I'm very excited about right now, but they don't look so great. And the reason why they don't look so great is because this is this difficult inverse reconstruction process. Um, these are actually a bunch of LiDAR reconstructions um, uh, from Kitty. Um, it's a very famous data set in computer vision. Um, but you see there's a big visual discrepancy between those two things. And now the big challenge is, of course, how could we get from here, how can we make this stuff here look like that one? And this is the big opportunity here um, that I would like to highlight with neural rendering, right? This is the key um, inside is maybe we can we can figure out how can we use a neural network to make this stuff here look like that stuff. We've already seen this a little bit in the last lecture, but this is what I want to follow up a little bit. So if you're talking about traditional computer graphics on one hand side, and on the other hand side, um, we can talk about deep learning methods. And specifically, we talk about the generative models that we have seen in the previous end lectures. So obviously, both of these things have very similar goals, right? What you're trying to do is you have some sort of description of an environment or of some sort of image, um, and you wanna generate an image or possibly a video as an output, right? Um, in computer graphics, I've just given you kind of a, you know, 
a, a, a 10 minute crash course what you can do you basically have these 3d models right you have the textures the shading and then you synthesize uh you get a synthetic image out of it right and this is like an example for instance from star wars where they they had the the actor being remodeled um and then synthetically inserted into the movie right this is kind of the decomposition here of the different um layers in the uh, in the lighting pipeline um and on the other hand and again here we have like there's artists they created these models there's a lot of manual labor that went into this kind of stuff and on the other side we have things like um the progressive GAN paper, right? Um, where we, we have our discriminator, our generator, right? And we have this, this loss function that tells us, is it, is it in, the, in the distribution of real images? Um, and in this case, we, we don't have a lot of control for this method here, but rather we have, uh, we have this uh, latent vector Z where we, we're taking this vector in and we're generating the images as output, right? So these are very different paradigms. Um, here we are purely learning from data, right? We just want to mimic our data. We have very little control, um, but we also don't need a lot of manual effort, right? We just have a neural network. This neural network learns this distribution and I can synthesize new images. Whereas here's the opposite. I have all control. I have a 3D model. I can use the 3D model. Um, and um, yeah, I can basically go, go ahead and uh, yeah, do whatever I want in the, in, in, in the resulting output, right? But it costs me a lot of effort, right? So this is kind of the, the, the drawback. Um, and the idea of neural rendering is essentially, and this is a very broad definition of what I'm making right now, you will see like people interpret a bit of different things with it. Um, one thing you could say about neural rendering is uh, you want to do something like novel viewpoint synthesis. So instead of having this explicit 3D content that I've just explained to you, you could train a conditional GAN or a conditional generative network that takes as input a camera, right, position. And implicitly in the neural network, it encodes all the entirety of the scene description, like the lighting materials, and shading, and all of this kind of information. They could be all encoded in a black box neural network, right? Yeah, and then, and then as output, you could basically get the novel views, and all you have to do is you have to change the six degree of cameras, right? And um, this is kind of this idea of neural rendering. And now we kind of, we're taking a, a, a conditional neural network, right? A conditional generative neural network, and we're conditioning it on the current camera pose. And at test time, we want to basically generate a video as output um, that, that is corresponding to the current camera pose that we're feeding in. So instead of having this graphics pipeline with the ray tracer, the rasterizer, we're just having this black box network um, that gets us the respective output image. Now, one way to do that, as we already saw that actually, um, is actually relatively straightforward with the techniques, what we have already learned. Um, we can do novel viewpoint synthesis um, with pix to pix for instance, right? So pix to pix is our conditional again. Um, and what we do is for the ground truth data for training, what we need is we need um, images with the respective camera poses, right? So what we could do is we take a bunch of photos of a scene, right? Um, and we know with some sort of structure from motion method, we know the current camera pose. And all we're doing right now is we're training this conditional again. The conditioner is the current camera position. And then we have the re-rendering loss um, that tells us for this camera position, you have to produce this kind of image, right? And then the hope is, let's say we're overfitting this network to one specific scene. So let's say for one scene, we have a couple of hundreds, thousands maybe of images. Um, we train them in this one scene. Now for testing, you would still have the same scene, so it is overfitted to the scene, um, but we give the, the network unseen poses to generate new images from these different poses, right? So you want to have like a camera trajectory that goes around an object or so. Um, so this is still has to channelize, right? This, this network has to figure out how to extrapolate or interpolate between the current camera poses. And as I mentioned, camera poses is, um, is a six degree of freedom vector, right? So we have a six dimensional vector and it turns out six dimensions is actually pretty high already. It's a, it's a, it's a non-trivial dimensionality we have to deal with here. So it's not such an easy problem. Um, but if we're doing this very naively with, with picks to picks, um, it's pretty straightforward, right? We just, need to, we just need to get this input data. We need the poses for it. We constrain the re-running loss and then we generate new images for new poses, right? by running the network with new conditions. Um, and let's say for simplicity, we're doing this on synthetic data. 
Um, so we're going ahead, right? We're having here, uh, we have the spinning cube. Um, we used original graphics methods to create the ground truth data that makes it a bit easier. Um, we have ground truth poses. We know the current, like how this cube here is spinning. Um, and we also, uh, we also, you know, know the, I have the ground truth images that we rendered to begin with. And now we, we're training this pix to pix network such that it's conditioned on the respective target, right? Um, you see, it looks not perfect, but you know, like it's pretty straightforward to train and you're getting results that look like these ones here. Um, this is just a naive conditional GAN that is conditioned on the current viewpoint and it's kind of replacing this complicated or complicated graphics pipeline, right? Uh, and, 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 and has an end-to-end -end neural network here that generates uh, the respective output renderings. Um, and we have in fact seen other versions of this already, not just for novel viewpoints. Novel viewpoints was now one example where the conditioning is only the camera pose. But you could go ahead and say, well, instead of the camera pose, we're conditioning it on different things, such as faces, which we have seen with the uh, deep video portrait paper. Um, the video portrait is basically, the conditioning here is the 2D image of the faces, right? The positions in the eyes. And then you have pics to pics that makes kind of a, a, a resulting output rendering out of this. Or, or everybody dance now, same thing, right? So here we're conditioning it on the human skeleton um, and pics to pics again out of this detected skeleton here at the bottom, what do you see? Um, it makes a realistic image out of it again, right? So you can do this as various different conditionings, um, but um, you will see sometimes it works better, sometimes it works worse. Um, so this is like the basic idea of neural rendering right now. So we're replacing this graphics pipeline with all the methodologies that we have seen now in the previous one, two, three lectures, right? Um, so, so far I haven't really told you anything new in terms of, um, um, you know, how to do neural rendering properly. I more or less just reformulated the problem from a different perspective, right? So now we're looking at it from a graphics standpoint um, and we're trying to replace the standard graphics pipeline with our neural network. Um, to get the rendering done for us. And this is what we call neural rendering though. Um, but I wanted to quickly go back to this, to this example of the novel viewpoint synthesis. Um, and it turns out this is actually a pretty complicated setting here. Um, and in this case, we have the spinning cube, right? Um, and the spinning cube actually um, has text on it. So it has very fine scale detail. So the network has to actually learn um, how to go from the current camera pose to the respective target rendering. And this turns out to be pretty challenging, especially for these um, for these fine scale text uh, text builds here, right? Um, and the reason why this is actually really challenging, if we are going back to our neural network, the big challenge is we have a two D convolution in every layer, right? Or a bunch of two D convolutions. So we have a series of two D convolutions that make up. Um, that have to learn kind of this three D space now, right? It's a pretty challenging thing. We have a three D space. Um, but we're kind of abusing a 2D network to try to learn it. And as a result, you see that you have these like swimming and flickering artifacts, right? It's not, it's not perfect. It's not, it doesn't look perfect. Um, and, and one idea to remedy this, and this is a very recent trend in neural networks is to say, well, maybe these 2D convolutions, they are not so great. Maybe we want to go um, to 3D. And this is what, what Deep Voxels is doing. This is one of the um, yeah, first papers that looks at this. And the main idea is basically it's very similar to to uh, to to uh, pix to pix from a from a high level conditioning part, but the difference is why do we have to learn these three D operators with two D convolutions, right? Why do, why don't we do this directly in three D so the network has a much easier time to handle that? Um, we know how our three D transformations work, right? If you have a camera pose, it's a rotation and a translation. Um, it's a sixth of vector. We know how to apply this to, let's say, a voxel grid or a mesh or so, right? Um, and the idea is we can incorporate these operators directly into the architecture. Um, and as long as they are differentiable, you can still learn the missing pieces, right? And like this is what this deep voxel paper is doing. Um, this is an example application that also works for a viewpoint synthesis. So in this case, again, give me the rigid pose of the camera and then generate me a new viewpoint for that. So if we're having a simplified pipeline of deep voxels, um, it's still very similar than before. So the idea is at training time, what you have is a source image. You have a 2D network that extracts features, um, the standard unit, 
uh, you're taking this unit and you're projecting these features from 2D to 3D. This is now a voxel grid in the middle here. Um, the way I have to do that is I have to basically, from this image, I need to know the pose. This is a note from the training data. This is this R and T. This is my training rigid pose. Um, and I need to know how to project from 2D to 3D. That one I know with the intrinsic parameters of, this, of the camera matrix, right? Then I run a bunch of 3D convolutions in 3D. Um, this is a, a standard, it's pretty much a, a standard 3D unit architecture. There's nothing super special about it, except that in, in pixels, it runs on voxels now. Um, and then what you do is you reprojecting these 3D features to a new view. So now for a respective target view, you have again a rotation and translation for your camera pose. You have a projection layer that goes from 3D to 2D. Again, you know that from the intrinsic, you run a bunch of 2D convolutions and then you you force this network or you constrain this network to produce this output again, right? Um, and this whole thing, the idea is, this can be trained end to end. And what you're learning is basically, you're learning the feature extractors from here, here to here, but you don't have to learn the, the, the 2D, 3D projections and you don't have to learn the rotations and the translations because they implicitly, uh, so they're explicitly encoded into the network architectures already. Now, this is already pretty interesting. Um, there's one small detail that I ignored here right now. This is a bit of a simplified version of this deep voxel work. Um, and one problem that we're gonna have later is we have to check, we don't have the depth data here yet. So this is something, uh, there's a bit of more stuff missing. So the, the whole pipeline would look something like this. Um, in this case, um, we have actually, again, the 2D part, we have the 2D network, we get 2D features. We're lifting these features to 3D. Um, we're having some 3D operators here, basically a 3D unit. Um, then you're reprojecting to 2D. Now here's an occlusion network. I'll explain to this in a second. This part actually enforces the depth, um, the depth prediction because you don't have the depth. So this part here is actually not so straightforward because you don't know the depth how to project this. And so you need to know whether the current voxel is visible in the current 2D point. Um, and then what you're doing is you're constraining some output and you have a discriminator loss at the end of the day that tells you is this output in the distribution of this current object. Um, and this whole thing is being used for training. So, so this part here is all the training. In a testing, you would only use that part. And it looks like this here. In this case, we have a test time. The whole scene or the whole object description is encoded into the network here, into these features. And now what you can do is you feed in different rotations and translations to force the network to produce different target output results, right? Um, this is how you test. And, and now that's pretty nice because you're starting from the 3D representation at test time. And all you have to do is you have to change the, um, the respective camera viewpoint by explicitly feeding it in, right? So the network doesn't have to learn that complicated transformation anymore. Um, and I'll show you in a second that this is actually working much, much better. And the reason why it works better, you don't have to learn the 3D operator. You already have it implicitly encoded. Okay. Um, one thing I, I, this occlusion network, I mentioned we don't have the depth. Um, the way this works is, let's say you have this feature grid in 3D here. You have the camera pose here. So um, along this ray, you know which voxel will touch this ray. And what you can do is you can think about this as a canonical view. So you just have this voxel, that voxel, that voxel, that voxel, that voxel. Along this ray, you just put it in a canonical grid. It's just a reordering of the of the of the uh, frames here, and now what you know is there's going to be one value, which is the visible value. This is the visibility reasoning, so to say, right? You want you need to know um, which pixel is the visible one, basically, right? Um, you don't know it, but you can learn it. So all you're doing is you're running simply a softmax here um, that tells you which one is the right probability, um, and this is basically uh, a depth estimation network. What's happening here? So this network implicitly estimates the depth by knowing that the reprojection error needs to be nice, uh, needs to be good. So there's no explicit loss here that tells you what this occlusion network should be. The only thing it knows that, oh, this reprojection needs to look like um, whatever it sees on the counterpart of the real examples, right? Okay, so this one works surprisingly well. Um, if you're comparing this, you're getting results that look like these ones. So again, here at the bottom, we see the pix to pix baselines. And here we see the deep voxels uh, comparison. Like if you're looking at this first spinning cube here, 
you see that suddenly you can see the letters and everything else, right? So it looks significantly better than here. And again, this is the same amount of training data, um, roughly the same network size, um, except now you have these explicit 3D operators encoded in that representation, right? That you don't need so much data. If you know something already, um, that's pretty good. You can put this in the network and make it differentiable and then be more efficient. So that's a very recent trend, actually, we will be seeing a couple of times now um, that, yeah, that, that these, these rendering networks and so on, um, you kind of have stuff you know how to do, like some part of the rendering pipeline you know, like 3D operators, like projections and so on, you know them, you just make them differential and put them in a network. You don't have to learn them because you already know how these things work. Like if you want to add two numbers, right, you don't learn how to add two numbers, you just have an operator to add them. Um, but other things you don't quite know how they work, um, like the shading, the lighting variation, sometimes this is hard to capture for reconstruction purposes. In this part, you let the network take over. And this is kind of this idea of neural rendering that you can mix these ideas. You have explicit representations and implicit representations. So here's another direct comparison against um, the very two data sets here. Um, pix to pix and deep voxels, right? So it looks just much better. If you're looking closely, you see it's also not perfect on the edges here. So here it's a little bit chittery. Um, and the problem there basically is that there's an explicit voxel size. This voxel size is, this, this cube is only in a 32 cube volume. Um, and you see the voxel representations here. And that issue um, is something you can see in the final renderings. So if you had a higher voxel resolution, it would be better. But unfortunately, there's going to be some limit in terms of what we can fit actually uh, onto the GPU. Right. Um, but there's a very cool insight here. Um, in this deep voxel work, this lifting from 2D to 3D works really great. No take care for uh, like temporal coherency. You have the 3D operators implicitly encoded. They need to be differentiable, of course, um, but it works pretty well. Um, this, this was done for normal viewpoint synthesis. Um, in principle, you could also do this for like dynamics. You could just move the voxels around, right? That's kind of the, the high level idea. Um, limitation right now here was that it was, it was limited due to the dense uh, 3D voxel grid. So this was one of the methods I wanted to show you a bit in more detail, but now I wanna go back one level back, right? Um, one, a little bit more high level. Um, and this was done on voxels, but in principle, you can do this for, for other things too. And there have been actually a couple of different papers that appeared. Um, you can do this, so on voxel grids, we've just seen that, right? Um, you can do multi, multi-plane images, you can do some compositing between the images, uh, you can do it completely image-based, you can use point clouds. There was um, a neural point-based graphics paper very recently, a very cool paper. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you the references later, you can look these ones up. I don't have time to go into all of them, but very similar idea, instead of having voxels, you have points. Um, or you can actually do something more extreme, you can do completely implicit functions. This is one thing that has been shown very recently. So they say, okay, well, it's, let's use the 3D part for the supervision, but the network itself is just a fully connected layer, basically. Um, it sounds pretty cool when you name it implicit functions, um, but in practice, that's just a fully connected layer. Um, and then there's different versions of, of renderers, right? Like this one we've just seen, volumetric ray-based. Ray that's what this, uh, this occlusion network was basically doing. If you take multiple images, decompose them, that's like alpha compositioning. You can do rasterization. For points, you would use splatting. And for implicit functions, you can do stuff um, like, like sphere tracing and so on, right? Um, so basically, we have these two um, aspects. We have, on one hand, we have the scene representation and we have the differentiable render. And this is one thing that will come a little bit, this term differentiable render, you will hear a couple of times now, because basically what you have to do now is you have to train this whole pipeline end to end, right? And from going from these 3D feature voxels, like in, 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 in deep voxels, you have to basically learn these features by this projection matrix. And this is essentially a differential renderer. It could be ray based, it could be also uh, rasterization based. Um, there's a couple of pros and cons between these representations, right? Um, if you're doing this kind of stuff on images, you have very fast rendering, high quality. Cons, you don't have so much flexibility. You only have a two, uh, yeah, you have only 2.5D size, right? That's, that's the drawback. Um, the deep voxels, it's true 3D. That's great. We have all the control. We don't have to learn most of the things. 
Um, but the memory grows very, very quickly. That's, that's the drawback, right? Um, if you're doing rasterization based, well, then it's high quality. Um, I didn't go into too much detail here. This is maybe something you should you should look up yourself. Um, but it's it's in the same lines, right? So um, you also have to differentiate again through the rasterization process, and then you can do these kind of uh, these these kind of things and use like blending weights um, how how to combine different uh, images. Uh, point clouds. Point clouds in principle are pretty good. Um, yeah, they are high quality to some degree, but if you don't, if you miss a bunch of points, you're pretty screwed. So you need good, good quality of the structure from motion to begin with. Um, if you're missing points, you don't have it in the representation, and the network can't just hallucinate points where there aren't points. That's a big problem of this one. Um, but there's a couple of really cool papers. There was a group from uh, Skoltech uh, and Samsung AI uh, in Moscow. They have done this po a neural point-based graphics paper. I would encourage you to look that one up. This is a really nice paper. Okay. Um, implicit functions, um, that's something we haven't talked too much about. And this is what I wanted to talk a little bit right now. Um, these ones are all explicit representations. And a very new trend in neural rendering is uh, to just get rid completely of the explicit representations. Um, and yeah, the idea is basically, um, so you have a camera, right? And you're shooting a ray and the network tells you how far can you shoot the ray until you find the surface point. Now, the way you would implement this is you take a scene representation that is literally just an MLP, right? Um, it gets basically as input, um, it checks where you are in the viewpoint. Uh, so this point here right now, this 3D point, it has a direction, it shoots this, this point in this direction, and it tells you how far can you step before you find the surface point. And this is kind of like sphere tracing, if you've heard of this. So sphere tracing means is if you're in a distance field or so, you can make a step equal to the distance and you're guaranteed to not hit a surface before that. And this is kind of what this renderer here learns. Um, and the idea is that eventually, once you iterate this process, eventually you will hit the surface. And this is completely encoded in this implicit network, so there's going to be um, it's kind of like a query. You're just shooting an array and you're asking how far can I go before I go to the next thing. There's no explicit representation anymore. You only have these iterative query points, right? Um, and this actually can generalize. So basically, once you have enough arrays you're shooting, um, then at some point the network within a scene, it knows how to extrapolate and has some basic generalization how to look at different things. Um, and they had a couple of cool, this was a NURBS paper from last year. Um, so they had a couple of cool results. So they basically can do stuff like reconstructions from a single image that looks like, looks like this one. So they have this image as input and now they can generalize and can hallucinate what the respective surface looks like, um, right? And this is kind of the normal field they're getting. It looks kind of cool. Um, it's a very interesting idea. So basically, they said, okay, let's not use an explicit representation. Let's just use this implicit notation of a multi-layer perceptron and query how far can I shoot the rays in order to hit a surface. And very, very recently, there's another follow-up paper. Um, uh, I'm very excited about that one because they showed really good results. Um, it's called Nerf Null, Render, uh, Null Radiance Fields. Um, this is a paper from Berkeley and Google. And what these guys are doing is... Uh, they're having a very similar idea. They also have a camera, um, they have a near plane here, far plane here, this defines the frostum. And they also have an implicit scene representation. So what they're saying is basically, again, shoot me a ray. And then they have, uh, so in this case, they have uh, an MLP, right? They have, uh, they have a positional encoding that tells you where it is. They have a few direction. And then they're gonna, they're gonna predict this radiance field um, along this ray, what the color is basically. So they go just from from R6 to R2, from R6 to R3, and this is again all encoded in a multi-layer perceptron. They have a couple of layers, of course, um, but there's no explicit 3D structure. Um, and what they have done is they have the renderer. What it's doing is it's just take my current ray. Well, I have my camera point. I have my ray direction, right? Um, that's this R6 here, and um, my view direction. Um, and then this network just predicts you along this view direction, what is the current color going to look like? But you need this, this positional encoding. This is a bit of a detail I'm ignoring right now. But what I would like you to understand is this is just an implicit network that basically for a given ray, 
tells you what the color along this ray is. Um, what's interesting about this network is they don't aim to do any generalization. They only basically for every surface point in 3D, this network kind of memorizes the color, right? So if you have a ray, it learns this mapping from the ray to the surface point, and from to the surface point, it knows what the color should be. Um, and they also do novel viewpoint synthesis, and they have really impressive results. So what they do is um, they uh, they recorded also they they took high quality images in fairness, so that's why it looks pretty good. Um, they took DSLR images um, of uh, of uh, of a couple of objects here, and then they use the network to generate. To basically interpolate the viewpoints. It's only an interpolation network, there's no generalization going on. Um, but the results look like this, and it looks actually pretty decent. Um, if you're comparing this to traditional computer vision methods, um, you're not getting a point cloud anymore, but in this case you're getting actually um, pretty good reconstructions. And these images are not, these viewpoints are not exactly in, in the training set, right? Uh, it's a good question, like how much can it extrapolate from the training views? But from a bunch of views, you can now move around the object in a free viewpoint notation. And this is kind of a nice thing. So I really encourage you to have a look at this. This paper came out, I don't know, like two months ago or so. Um, and it's pretty interesting. I, I, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, yeah, so um, these implicit functions is kind of a new thing <laughs> that, that is going in addition to that. Uh, in this case, we're going to have um, sphere tracing, which, which is kind of the renderer or some volumetric tracing, right? Um, it's, super high uh, it's super high quality if you have good data as input. Generalization is basically not happening right now. So you're not like doing something like completion or so, right? It's, it's, it's still very, very, uh, very challenging. It's, it's very expensive to train, takes forever. Um, basically you're shooting ray by ray, right? And for every ray you tr you're giving is one training sample, right? Um, it takes a while. It takes also a, a while to render because, again, you have to evaluate for every pixel is one forward pass basically in the network, right? Um, so that's the cons. But it's this is very recent, and if you're interested in research directions, I encourage you to have a closer look at this. Yeah, I wanted to show you one one final um, one final paper. Uh, this is actually a paper from our group. Uh, uh, this neural texture paper. Um, you can basically do neural rendering when you encode the features not in a volume as well. You can encode it if you encode it in a texture. So if you have 3D geometry that has been reconstructed with multi-view stereo, looks like that. So you have a surface texture um, that is embedded uh, into, the, uh, into the geometry. Um, so you have a standard UV parameterization, but instead of having an RGB texture, uh, what you have in this case is features that live on top of the mesh. And that's pretty nice because uh, basically every feature here is supposed to encode the local appearance of the mesh. And the way you train this is with a differential rendering step. So you're taking the, this, this 3D representation, you render it to a given view, so you're giving a 2D UV map and sample this texture. Then you have a 2D, a 2D unit um, that recreates a realistic image out of it again. Right? Um, and the idea is that you're training this whole thing end to end. So in other words, you're showing this network a couple of different output images for a set of given poses. Again, the poses are explicitly given here. Um, and what you're optimizing for is the neural texels. So the text, these texture values, in this case, they could be like eight to 16 dimensional. Uh, as well as the renderer, which is also a neural network that takes these texels again and makes a real image out of it again, right? Um, and again, this process can be trained end to end, which is very, very nice. Um, and at test time, what you would do is you would basically take only, uh, take only this part here, right? And what you do is you're simply changing the RNTs here. So you're changing the viewpoint and then you're getting new, new images that you can render as output. Um, so, yeah, this is, we call this paper deferred neural rendering. If you've done graphics, you know what a deferred renderer is doing. It first renders all the properties like material, uh, lighting, UV and stuff like that into 2D image space. Um, and these handcrafted maps are then taken by the neural renderer, uh, by the deferred renderer, and the renderer is then applying the shading equation and stuff like that, right? Um, and the idea now is, if you're having imperfect reconstructions, we're simply learning these feature maps, and we're taking the deferred neural renderer to make an image out of it again. 
Yeah, and this is then the, the final pipeline. And the core idea now is why this is actually useful is the assumption is if I'm getting a lot of these images, I would love to reconstruct 3D geometry. But this 3D geometry might not be perfect. If I'm running a multi stereo structure of motion pipeline, it will not be 100% perfect. So instead of saying, oh, we're solving computer vision and getting perfect 3D reconstructions, we're saying we're getting okay reconstructions and then changing the rendering pipeline with the neural renderer in order to get photorealistic images, despite the fact that the 3D content was imperfect. And you can apply these kind of things for a lot of different applications. Uh, you can do novel viewpoint synthesis. We've already seen a couple of these. You can do scene editing. So you can simply copy paste objects with a neural appearance, uh, or you can do animation synthesis and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I wanted to show you a few here first. This is novel viewpoint synthesis. Um, this was actually one of the sequences I showed you earlier. Uh, in this case, we have the input UV map, right? That is rendered. Sorry, it's not the input. This is like the, the, the rendered UV map that you're getting when you render this imperfect geometry of the sphere. Uh, and then you have the neural renderer that makes this one look like a real image again. And if you're comparing this to ground truth, again, these images are not in the test set, uh, not, in, not in the training set. Um, these are test images. And you see that whatever we're rendering here looks actually pretty damn close to whatever the real image would look like, even though this image here was not seen during training. So the generalizability here is pretty good because um, you have this 3D model and the neural renderer just has to make, just has to make sure that it looks like a realistic image of that scenery. But the 3D part is all abstracted away with the coarse rough reconstruction. Um, yeah, and, um, you can do scene editing in the very same way. So we have here an input sequence. We're running, uh, in this case, call map, uh, multi stereo method. Uh, you're getting some reconstructed geometry. And what you're doing is you optimizing again for the neural renderer as well as the features on the mesh. So this part here is the statue that's actually done, uh, it's actually uh, here at UM, um, uh, this bust uh, that we scanned. Uh, and now what you can do is you, you can take a crop of this geometry and copy paste this geometry twice here. Um, and as a result, you also copy paste the neural features here of this geometry, right? Uh, and now, if you're running the neural renderer on this imperfect 3D geometric representation, we can create novel viewpoint synthesis from the edited scene. So you can do stuff like this. This was the original one, this was edited with us, and this is the resulting output, right? So you can see these two busts here, they have been inserted. I can, I can show it again. Uh, and this is kind of the, the, the results you would get here. Okay. Um, you see, it's not perfect, actually. One thing you would see is missing. This bust here has a shadow, and the smaller ones don't. And the reason why they don't is our differentiable renderer is just a forward renderer and doesn't deal with shadows. Um, but this would be an obvious next step for a research project um, to figure out how, how to get the shadows here. But it's, we, didn't really, we didn't really bother too much. This was kind of a nice-to-have application in addition to novel viewpoint synthesis. What you can do now is if you simply uh, copy-paste uh, some of the geometry around. Okay. Um, you can do stuff for, for dynamic scenes. Um, in this case, we, uh, we're having here an Obama video. Um, from the original Obama video, what we did is we reconstructed the face. So we have here this face template. Um, and the neural textures are now embedded on the face template. And what the goal is, the neural renderer should then figure out how to inpaint this region here in the middle. And this on the right-hand side is then the rendered respective target output. Uh, in this case, we're taking a source video here. Um, this one is not contributing to the actual uh, neural renderer. This one is only taking the poses that we're then projecting on the reconstructed face from Obama. And again, this one is then a completely synthetically generated output video. Um, but it's the same technique as before the novel viewpoint synthesis. The only difference is now that the 3D model is parameterized by a source video that tracks, that is being tracked. And based on these post parameters of the face model, you can then uh, change the, 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 the 3D model here of the face and the neural renderer will make sure this one gets inpainted again. Um, and yeah, this is actually pretty high resolution now. <laughs> um, and compared to the other GAN methods, these kind of things, they can be trained in a few hours. So it's pretty fast to train. Uh, it needs only a, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand images to train. So it's pretty, pretty efficient. And, it, and the reason why it's so efficient to get this for videos is because we have this hybrid representation, right? We have the network on one side, 
uh, and we have the 3D mesh on the other side. So we don't have to learn all the 3D stuff, right? That kind of makes this little rendering direction pretty nice. Okay, but I wanted to show you some, uh, some results here. Um, now this is the target. Again, this is completely synthetic. And why? I, I would really say Clinton, probably. I would have to say Clinton. And why? Uh, there was a little spirit. Uh, frankly, he would have been had he... And why? I, I would... But I see, you can kind of get it. And of course, you know, we had a lot of fun with it. We tried our, our favorite target people. Um, we thought, uh, yeah, these two will fit very well together, Bernie Sanders and, and Macron. President Trump has stated tonight and over and over again in recent weeks that this country faces a national emergency. Or our, our favorite tech companies. I joined Google 15 years ago and have been privileged to serve as CEO for the past three years. Um, yeah, you can look up these, these videos. They are, they're obviously all online. Um, but yeah, I think it's pretty cool actually. You can, with this kind of stuff, you can get very, very, very nice renderings. And the nice thing what you can do now is you can actually go ahead and say, well, instead of taking the source video, you can take any other input basically. here. Like the cool thing is we have this null renderer, null renderer produces kind of always good results. Um, so we thought, well, why don't we use, for instance, voice as input, right? So you can animate this guy um, with taking um, voice or even text as input. So this is a very recent project that also Eustace has been doing. Um, uh, neural voice puppetry. Um, the idea here is basically we want to feed in a, a, a kind of, we want to basically give virtual assistants a face, right? So you have like Siri and, and Alexa and these kind of virtual assistants and we want to basically synthesize the respective video avatar to it. But instead of hiring an artist to model our video avatar for us, we just want to train a neural renderer um, to figure out how it should look like. Um, yeah, in practice we have uh, some application that looks like that. So right, we have here some text and from this text, we want to synthesize the respective video. Hey Siri, can you show, can you show me your face? Sure. sure. What about, what about this one? one? With, neural With neural voice puppetry, I can, I can have every face, face you like. You, you can also, can also control, control different faces just, just with your voice. Let's have, Let's have a look at some results. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. So the question is, how does that work? Our pipeline. Um, well, most of the stuff I've already shown you. Um, the good thing is um, you can basically text, take only the text here as input. Um, and the idea here is we first taking some audio features. We're just using deep speech. That's a state of the art audio network. And the output of this network here from deep speech um, is a set of features. And these features from deep speed, from the audio here, from deep speech, um, we're feeding, um, uh, <coughs> we're feeding then um, into another linear layer, basically, that we're mapping to audio expressions that drive a facial 3D model. And then we have our standard neural rendering pipeline. We have a 3D facial model. We have a neural renderer that generates a respective image or video out of it. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details here. But the key part is here basically how do you translate audio features into the respective blend shapes. We didn't talk too much about the blend shapes here of the face, but think about it this way. This is, there's some animation control of the face that is being driven by, um, uh, by the audio then. And this is learned. So all you're doing right now is uh, at training time, you taking a video, you're tracking the face of the video, um, you're correlating the audio to the tracked 3D face model, um, and then what you do is you, you, you're using deep, uh, the deep speech features input here and you, you're figuring out how, how do the uh, audio features here map to the respective uh, face uh, parameters, right? Um, these ones then, they are, this is person specific. So this face model here is being fitted specifically to this one video. Um, and the neural renderer is also optimized for this one video. But everything up to here, these audio features, um, these audio expression features, they are being channelized across everything. And the reason why it works so well is because we're using deep speech. That's a very powerful um, audio network that is basically trained on, uh, on speech to text or pre-trained on, on, on speech to text. Okay, so then we have audio expression training. That's what I've just explained. The way you train this, um, this channelized part, in this case, we took a bunch of videos from the German TV stations. Uh, we reconstruct the faces here. We have up to hundreds of commentators of available videos. 
um, and all with their kind of neural, uh, uh, neutral talking style, right? And neutral is important. You didn't want to have too much variety that made it a little bit easier, basically, for us, right? Um, yeah, and then you're getting results like this. Es ist ein Überraschungsputsch gegen Kauder, den treuen Kanzler Knappen, vor allem aber gegen Angela Merkel. Selbst ihre Entschuldigung für die Affäre Maaßen, eine für ihre Verhältnisse fast extreme Demutsgeste, half nicht mehr. Die Mehrzahl der eigenen Abgeordneten hatte die Nase voll von einem Machtbündnis, in dem das Kanzleramt bestimmte und Fraktionschef Kauder die Mehrheiten organisierte. CDU. Yeah, so what you just saw is basically now this model here. How does it map to the respective 3D model, right? So we can basically animate a synthetic model with that. Um, but now we have our neural renderer again. Uh, and the neural renderer um, is taking this model here as input and then generates the respective video output. Okay. Um, yeah. And in this case, we also blend it with a background. Same thing as before, right? You have our target video frame. You're having this face part that should be animated. Um, and then you have a compositing network that figures out how the respective target is. It's the same thing that we had before, pretty much. Um, and, and then you can, you can animate the whole thing with the audio input, right? So here we have audio input and we're then getting the respective video output. Science makes progress by steps. Most of those steps are small, some are slightly bigger. Uh, seen from the outside, sometimes people have the impression that, oh, there's this big breakthrough, breakthrough, and journalists like to talk about breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. But actually, science is very, very progressive because we gradually understand better the world. Okay, so one thing I didn't mention here, obviously this network needs audio as input, but you can run it with text as well. You simply run a text-to-speech method, right? There's a bunch of text-to-speech engines, um, uh, you can use Tacotron and stuff like that. Um, there's, um, I think Amazon Polly is one of them, but there's a bunch of them and you can just take these ones. And since this audio model flow is channelized, it basically works with any input. Um, and because of that, um, this model is actually quite versatile. So we had a demo actually online from Neural Voice Puppetry um, where you could put in some text and then you can, can control your, your favorite avatar, which was kind of interesting. Um, unfortunately, we had to take it down because people started abusing it a little bit, maybe we, we underestimated this whole thing a little bit, uh, what you can do with it. We were actually mainly hoping that, you know, you can do your virtual assistant, but obviously there's also some ethical concerns um, we should be considering. So <laughs> at the moment we disabled it, um, but we'll have to see um, whether we put it up again. Okay. Um, yeah, but getting back to neural rendering, I mean, the, the reason why I'm so excited about it is kind of like all these problems in computer vision that were pretty difficult to do from a visual standpoint, you can now do with neural networks very, very easily. And, and this hybrid of taking some 3D information from graphics and then using the neural networks on top of it um, works surprisingly well for, for many, many things. So there's, of course, still a lot of open challenges. Um, I think this whole thing of like photorealistic reconstruction is kind of cool, right? How do you go from here to here? Um, this is indeed, of course, uh, a still a very, very challenging problem and we are we're by no means um, yeah, are we, are we done with that? Um, so there's, there's still a lot of research to be done here. Um, I, I think the, the biggest challenge right now is basically if you're talking about traditional computer vision methods, right? They get us to here. Um, and we're talking about the final image that we want at the end of the day. Let's say this kind of stuff here is being done with a, with, with a neural network right now, with a neural renderer. The biggest challenge right now is how much does the network do and how much, how good does the reconstruction have to be? I mean, traditionally speaking, the computer vision community has been trying to make this one here better, right? Um, it's, it's a tricky problem going from 2D back to the 3D representation because it's very, very under constrained. It requires a lot of priors and thought processes. Yeah, so it's a, it's a challenging problem. Um, neural rendering has now enabled the idea of like, okay, we, we, we just say, okay, it's still broken, we can't deal, we can't deal with it, but we take a neural network and fix the rendering process. So obviously these two things, um, they, they have some synergy, right? Like how much can the network do and how good does the reconstruction have to be at the very end of the day? And this is a very, very fundamental question that I think is a very interesting open challenge. But I think ultimately these things, they should go together, right? Maybe, maybe you, can, you can do this end to end. You can have a differentiable 3D reconstruction, right? And get better reconstructions based on the respective target appearances and so on. 
Um, we've tried a few funny experiments here. Um, this is when you're taking a box and this box is our 3D proxy that we're taking as the neural rendering input um, in order to recreate this image of the vase. So obviously this UV map here or this, this 3D mesh here is pretty bad in terms of the approximation of the vase. Um, the neural rendering network, the 2D part, can actually figure out how to go from here to here. All right, we're getting pretty close. Um, this 3D geometry is good enough to get us temporal coherence because the motion here and the motion here, they correlate pretty well, right? You're rotating both around the z-axis here. Um, however, we see that it's pretty, pretty blurry here in the middle. So it's not perfect, of course, right? It's a, it's a pretty tricky problem. The network has to basically figure out how to go from this box to this vase. Um, so it's not perfect. And yeah, that's, that's the question now, right? I mean, how much can I do from one to the other? Um, one thing I can probably tell you already, if the tracking, if this motion here was inconsistent with that motion, it would horrendously break. Um, we've seen some of these examples for everybody dance now, right? This is a black box network. There's no 3D underlying context in the architecture yet. Um, in that case, if the tracking is not perfect, it's inconsistent. You would have wrong mappings for wrong points. But if you if you all if you map wrong and you consistently map wrong, that's okay, as long as it's consistent, right? Um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting, and. Yeah, now the big challenge here is how much how much can the eye do and how good do I have to reconstruct? And this is a, I mean, I, as you saw, most of these papers, they have appeared basically a few months, maybe half a year ago. Um, most of this stuff is still super open research topic. There's still a lot of stuff missing there. Um, yeah, so that's, it's still up in the air right now. Okay, the other big challenge is 3D operators or even 4D operators in the networks, right? Um, I'm mentioning here one example of the capsule network paper. This was a paper in 2017 from Jeff Hinton, uh, Hinton's team um, that was very popularized. It didn't work so well, um, but the idea was kind of cool. They said, oh, in, yeah, computer vision is inverse graphics, so we kind of need to learn affine transformations going from 2D back to 3D and then have like capsules to understand what's going on there. And the idea was kind of, right, if you have these capsules, you need significantly less training data. Uh, and they, they got a lot of good results for, for very small, trivial tasks. Um, but the scalability of the training was really challenging. So it didn't converge so well. It, I mean, eventually the results um, didn't quite live up to the expectation. But I think that the, the idea behind it was really cool because they thought, well, don't just use 2D convolutions and aggregate features with some pooling operator at the end but rather learning underlying structures from an image back to kind of like this, this affine transformation space. Um, so I think generally speaking, if you're talking about neural networks, right? I mean, from a research side, like appending a bunch of 2D layers, doing some neural architecture search possibly, that's a, I wouldn't say done deal, but it's a research wise pretty explored. The question is more like now, well, how do we, how do we learn 3D operators? How do we embed 3D operators, differentiable non-operator learning and stuff like that? That's a thing that we should really consider into neural networks these days. That, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, uh, yeah, problem we have to address. Um, yeah, I would also, uh, I would also um, <laughs> ask you to have a look um, at the state of the art report. This is very recently, it was at Eurographics. Um, there's a lot of people involved, them, including our team too. Um, between like Facebook, Google, Adobe, like all the people that do this kind of neural rendering. Um, so there's a lot of resources that you can look up, and this goes basically, yeah, to to a lot of different uh, to a lot of different uh, things from novel viewpoint synthesis to animation to facial retargeting, text to video, and stuff like that. So all of these kind of things are are covered here, and a lot of the things I talked about today, a lot of the slides were actually from this course. Um, they're going to be there. There's also another video up there. Um, feel free to look that up. Um, you can check it out on, uh, I think, on my Twitter account or so. Um, uh, and these kind of things are pretty interesting. I think if you're interested in research in these directions, I would, or even for the projects right now in this course, um, I would highly recommend to look up these kind of things. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, there's a lot of new research coming up um, that's worthwhile looking at it. Okay, um, 
yeah, I'm a little bit done early actually with the slide deck. Um, uh, I hope I didn't rush too quickly through it. Um, I still hope that uh, a lot of these things are very interesting to you. And we have basically one more lecture right now. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, high level representations, point clouds, 3D scene understanding. You've already seen a bit of 3D stuff today as part of the neural rendering, um, but there's a little bit more coming, coming to it, right? Um, so that's something I feel that is also still very interesting. Um, again, like 2D deep learning has been a bit explored, so we have to think about, you know, what's next, like 3D, 4D maybe. Um, yeah, there's a couple of cool, interesting new things coming up. Um, other, other than that, I hope you, you're still enjoying your project. Um, keep pushing. Um, this is your opportunity right now to realize your own uh, deep learning projects. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, see you, see you in the next, see you in the next lecture. Uh, thanks a lot for the attention.